Hi there. Thank you for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Artcast, the show where a couple of visual, visual storytellers get together to take on various topics that tend to cross one's path when you go into the forest adventures of communicating with images. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drost. I am a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... Oh, hey, I'm Rob Stenzinger. I do user experience design and research. I, I do some coaching and creating interactive experiences as well. And Jersey, we have a special guest today, back for his seventh appearance on the show, Ryan Estrada. Welcome back, Ryan. Thank you very much. Ryan Estrada of, and they pull up his Lots website. To say about Ryan. Yeah, there's a ton to say. All right, let's let's go through the Ryan Estrada of RyanEstrada.com, uh, the recently renovated and updated RyanEstrada.com. Um, artist, author, and adventurer, and co-author of the celebrated book Band Book Book Club. Congratulations on that, Ryan. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's uh, it's been going very well. Who knew that this whole time all I had to do is ride my wife's coattails uh, <laughs> to success? Um, it's a book about my wife's uh, experiences growing up, and uh, somehow uh, that has gotten more success than anything I've ever done put together. Kirkus starred review. That's mm -hmm. that, that's that's ban bananas. That is so that's. Congratulations. That's really awesome. Um, and published by Iron Circus Comics, too. Uh -huh. um, it's really it's really great to see Iron Circus, you know, uh, gaining more sort of attention and acclaim for the books that it's that, that Spike's been publishing. It's really great. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, so. uh, it's been doing extremely well. I think we didn't get a Kirkus. We got a Kirkus very good review, but we got starred reviews from Booklist, Publishers Weekly and School Library, School Library Journal. Journal. I'm looking at it right on the screen right now, and yeah. I, I should have been able to be more clear about that. Yeah, but yeah, you got a review on Kirkus, which is pretty great. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, Band Book Club. What if reading the wrong books could get you thrown in prison? Young Sook learned the hard way when her new after-school activity turned out to be a front for fascism fighting teens. A YA graphic memoir from Iron Circus Comics in bookstores, wherever you buy books or at your local library, and there's a handy link to buy the book right on riastrada.com. There you go. Um, but man, you have been, I mean, it's been a while since we had you on, but you've been uh, a pretty busy dude. Like, did, did you do some some Star Trek work recently? Uh, yeah, I'm working on more Star Trek now. I'm working on the third uh, ish installment of uh, the comic I do for them. Um, that's been really fun. I don't actually watch Star Trek, which is weird. <laughs> I don't know anything about Star Trek, but I'm, I'm on my third one now. Don't tell my editor. <laughs> uh, uh yeah, and I, I got to do some Popeye recently and some Garfield recently, and uh, it's just been a very, very busy, fun year. That's right. You did Garfield stuff, too, which which I thought was fantastic when I found out, because like one of the first things you and I ever did together when we hung out was uh, we were at a drink and draw, and you started passing around pieces of paper saying, everybody draw your worst Garfield. <laughs> that was like the first yeah. thing we did together, was drawing bad Garfields. Yeah. Bad Garfield <laughs> party. And I actually... Uh, in the Garfield comics, I actually drew Garfield differently in every strip that I did. And <laughs> they were all taken from, I went back to my drawings from that bad Garfield party and did the same models from that exact event. Wow. That's so great. So, um, yeah, we, we wanted to have you back, uh, just, you know, because, you know, we, we love talking with you about art and storytelling and managing a creative life. And as we were thinking about having you back, it, it occurred to me, at least, it was like, you know what? There's a common thread that the three of us have never discussed together, is that all three of us uh, have created stuff with our partners, with our spouses, um, the, the, you know, the closest person to us in our lives. And something that happened when uh, Science Comics Rockets came out, what was it, uh, spring of 2018, is whenever people talk to us about it, like, oh, you worked on it together. How did that go? And there's always this, like, this this tone of dread. Like, <laughs> certainly, you must have murdered each other and resurrected each other seven times in the course of making this thing together. Because how else can a married couple create anything together? And I was like, well, it's kind of just like being married, right? Isn't it? But uh, that said, there is like some. I'm sure we all have our own stories of like navigating this kind of complexity that comes out of creating something with the person that you are closest to so um if you guys are game i'd like to hit the music so we can dive into this episode and start talking about this what do you say let's do it all right yeah great all premise right. love it <laughs> 
Well then, All right. get fired up. <laughs> Let's get supercharged. Uh, so there's the music signifying that we are now in the episode. So um, yeah, what is it? What does it look like when you're making stuff with your partner? So we started this episode by introducing Ryan by saying like co-author of Band Book Club. I'm wondering, Ryan, if and I'm sure you've had had this conversation in a lot of interviews, but um, what did it look like when you and Hyung Suk were working together on this book? Well, it was a, a very different experience to working on anything else because it was like Kensuk is the only person I could work on this because, like I said, it's a, that's her on the cover. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's about it's about her life experiences, and um, I mean, it, it, I mean, we didn't have any like uh, drama or anything. Like it was great working together. Uh, she, uh, what what was interesting in our case was that Hyunsuk is not someone that ever considered making a comic. Like comics is this nerdy thing that I do that she's very supportive of, of, very supportive of and appreciates, but has never had any interest at all in making a comic or writing anything. And so it's, it's this weird thing where like, it's, it's hilarious for me now, it, like this being her first book and it going so well, she just thinks this is how it works when you make comics. <laughs> like, <laughs> just like, you know, she's she's uh she's getting invited out as a vip guest to the american library association she's getting starred she's never heard of a starred review she'd like she's get three of them she's like oh okay i got another one i don't know what that is uh she's like <laughs> just it must must just be that easy and i'm like this is going very well i have to sit her down and explain like this is very good <laughs> and so she's just like all right and i'm like there's a possibility you should be you could be a new york times best-selling author she's like all right I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, <right>. that's <laughs> great. Fun. She's like, well, no wonder you like this. This is actually pretty fun. Yeah. This is good. I'm like, yeah. Well, never mind all the all the effort that goes into everything else I've ever done. But yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> like more, sure, more people have read the review about your book than have read anything I've ever written put together. <laughs> but. <laughs> Oh, no, that's great. So how is that? I mean, how interesting the, so even establishing that, that context, I mean, it's, I mean, what a great situation to have something that had such great pent up demand, right. And to then just meet that market, right. That's, mm -hmm. that's, um, I think that's pretty savvy and, and, and maybe, you know, some good fortune in there too, but like, um, what, um, I mean, there, there need, I, I'm just curious, like how that, um, I mean, it's it, it it's fun to have that kind of surprising success or whatnot too. But in some ways, it's it, it's sort of, uh, I mean, you you had to have sort of had that really belief in that that work already. That I don't know, maybe uh, it's it, it's an interesting thing to say that. Um, well, yeah, you you, know, you have your project and it meets the world and it, and it hits because of all sorts of things. But I guess how how are you exploring that, right? Because it's neat to get the recognition, and it's 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 awesome, and, and hope, hopefully it just keeps on pouring in. But like, um, uh, I don't. I guess I just want. I don't want to leave it there. I love the. I love the yeah. excitement and the laugh of it too. But like, there's yeah. got to be more to the exploring the context of of um, just hitting the market at a good time with a great product, right? Like, yeah. What, I mean, what, what other ways are you are you looking at that? Yeah, I mean, it, it. I guess just right now, a book about fighting fascism that's creeping up in a government and people don't realize that fascism is coming and like that's kind of a thing on people's minds right now and especially like we've got a lot of support from libraries that's the thing that's on their mind and so i think yeah. it, it, it's not a surprise it's hitting big but like when we started like i said hyunsuk uh had no idea any of this story was interesting at all like i didn't know about the story until we'd already been married like six seven years and we'd known each other for like over a decade. Uh, like the, the way it came out, like it wasn't even like this like big confession. We were just taking a walk together on a mountain and she just like casually, she had met some friends and she just casually mentioned, oh yeah, back when we were in the band book club. And I'm like, wait, what? And she's like, oh, I never told you about that. I'm like, no, what's a band book club? She's like, oh yeah, I got interrogated by the KCIA and everything. It was a whole thing. And I'm like, well, what <laughs> and uh but the i mean even i like it was just this amazing thing i learned about my wife but i didn't think there was enough to like i was, i told people and they were like oh you should do a radio story or a little comic about it and i wasn't sure there was enough there because i 
I got, I got so little information, but it was Spike, our publisher that really like, uh, saw it because I, all I did is I posted like a tweet thread, like three tweets and Spike, uh, from Iron Circus saw that tweet. And then like a month later, subtweeted me about it. And she was doing a list of like her dream projects, things I'd like to publish. And one of them said, uh, my time in a band book club in Korea, if this is about you, if you think this is about you, it is email me. So I'm like, <laughs> are you subtweeting my wife? And she's like, yes. Do you want to make a book about it? And so that's how it all started. And uh, like I said, I didn't think I still was like, we'll, we'll give it a shot. And then like over the next year, all the other stories would come out, all the other things she didn't think were worth mentioning. But I'm like, what you did what and then like even even like we were we were a year in and i've been writing the script we've been doing interviews she'd been traveling around interviewing other people like reuniting with band book club members and uh like every single person we interviewed had been like all right i don't know if anybody's gonna read this but i'll tell you whatever you want to know and so but i was kind of struggling because when you're writing nonfiction, uh you know you don't have all the pieces like i had people don't remember everything and everything doesn't really necessarily come together in a perfect beginning, middle and an end. And um, so I'm struggling, like, how do I end this thing? There's no like narrative. And, I, and you know, you do kind of have to create little bridging elements to fit things together, but you want to keep it, you know, nonfiction. And the ending kept feeling too much from me and not from, you know, reality. And it was bugging me. And then all of a sudden, like she mentioned, like, because she had done the interviews in Korean and then translated them. And there's one bit that she hadn't translated because she didn't think it was interesting. And she's like, oh, yeah, back when they they burned all the newspapers. And I'm like, wait, what? You mean one of the main characters in the book who was in your band book club wrote something but was then taken and burned and everyone in the book was there. And it's a metaphor for everything that's happened and <laughs> so and resolves every plot line. She's like. Oh yeah, do you think that would work? I'm like, yes, tell me everything. <laughs> We've been working on this book for a year. So yeah, it's amazing how like for ev- for her and everyone involved, they don't think it's interesting because them it was just their life. Like they weren't. It wasn't like they were trying to change the world. They were like, this is our life. This is how we solve the problems that we have. Uh, mm. And so it was just that was just her college times and for everyone involved. And so that's, what's interesting as, you know, like back to working with your spouse is to be someone that can like hear that and see what works and what doesn't, because for her, she, you know, she has this amazing story, but she doesn't know what part is going to connect with someone else. Yeah. What I'm hearing in there is there was a lot of you acting as a, um, like a, a deep listener and providing reflection to what she the, the input that she was giving you like like listening really hard for like what's what's standing out and reacting to it to give that feedback to identify the parts that needed to go into the book right mm-hmm. um and then also there there was an element in there that I heard about researching because like there was like a lot of you going out and talking to people who were involved in this thing and putting together a picture based on all available information mm-hmm. yeah we uh we went back out to the town where she went to college. We went to her old university. Uh, we actually, luckily, uh, there was a, we, we got to walk through one of the buildings. Like we, it was empty because apparently they were going to like demolish it the next day. We didn't know that we just happened to get there and we went and took a bunch of pictures. Um, like it, we weren't supposed to go in there. Like all the furniture had been taken out, but we just kind of snuck in, took photos of like little corners where things could happen. And, um, like cl- what classrooms looked like. And then after that, we just kind of walked through like, here's where I would have gone to the park. Here's where this happened. Here's where I took the bus wow. and uh, like took all the pictures to make it accurate to the location. Um, and then she kind of just reunited with all the people that she had uh, been in the band book club with. Then we interviewed some teachers. We interviewed, uh, you know, people on like both sides of the political divide back then. Cause we wanted to, you know, get as many perspectives as possible to give like a real accounting of, and like those changed all, so much about the book. It wasn't just her story, but like we got to hear about her uh, friend who had um, uh, the, like I mentioned, worked in the school newspaper and he did like, he, uh, 
he did two he did two newspapers one was the official newspaper that was censored by the police like he had to show the, literally the police that would tell him you have to cut this article and then all the article everything he wasn't allowed to talk about he would go home and print his own secret newspaper uh which is the one that they burned when they found out about it and um like would hide it in certain places where people could find it and like risk risk going to prison to make his secret newspaper and so like the book doubled in length when that happened because like that's a that became a big thing so yeah it was a lot of research involved in this and the history and the people i wonder if you could talk a little bit about like this whole idea of living with and like what it was like for you and uh hyun suk uh living with knowing that you don't know everything Right. Because, like, I know that, like, this is something that comes up a lot in when Ann and I do uh, school visits for the Rockets book is that the research kept revealing all these big open areas that we didn't know about. Right. Like, and it was like, oh, well, we clearly, we don't, we don't fully understand G Force yet. Okay. Damn. We're going to have to, like, do a lot more research and talking to people, uh, experts on how, how G Force works and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so we had to learn to become very comfortable with not knowing everything there was to know about mm -hmm. the thing, you know, uh, like about halfway through, which kind of felt scary because it's like, oh, we're on deadline and we don't feel like we have a full grasp of this project or what this mm -hmm. thing is yet. Um, which, for some reason, when I'm writing my own fiction, it's not it's not pleasant but i can live with it but when it comes to something where it's like this is real this is like this is nonfiction. this really happened um i don't want to screw this up and i don't want to misrepresent anything and that became it felt like the stakes were a lot higher was was it like that for you too and if so like how did you guys manage that um yeah that was something i definitely thought about um especially with you know like the not you know everybody's memories this happened in the 80s like not knowing everything but like one of one of the things that i did early on and that we decided on was um we changed the name of the town that she lived in and the the name of the school which we, we made like a fictional name we also made fictional names for all the characters surrounding her um just because you know this is people's lives we didn't want to like something that i had someone say to make a plot line come across like reflect on someone else mm -hmm. um like for example uh like we have a lot of teachers that were uh doing uh very not good things to the students and like um you know i don't know exactly which person said what thing so we kind of condensed them into like we uh into like her shape her uh shakespeare teacher um so like I had, I made this character that was kind of an amalgamation of all these people. And um, I'm very, I'm very lucky that I, I'm very happy that I did make that change because later we, uh, another thing we did for not knowing everything, I had a lot of sensitivity, not sensitivity readers, but I just uh, had people read the book that had been involved in that situation, um, look over it and uh, just give their notes and what their ideas were. And one of the people that was so kind and so nice offered to read it. And it was her Shakespeare teacher, which was not oh. the bad guy. And I'm like, oh, let me tell you something. <laughs> this is not you. Um, uh, he does some very bad things. Uh, but she was totally cool about it. And it was, uh, she's like, she's like, it was clear that it was not her. We also like, there are some things that someone did that we didn't want to directly like me to somebody. Uh, and so uh, that's a re another reason we changed his job from what he actually taught to that. And so mm. she understood that. Um, but yeah, mostly it's just um, making sure that the people involved were, were cool with what we did and, uh, um, and that it felt accurate to them. Uh, even if, um, you know, like, there's no way of knowing what dialogue everyone said at any given moment, uh, but just making sure it, it felt real and was based on things that actually happened. And then just the history, uh, there's so much, I did so much research in the history, but we really tried to keep it about this small set of characters and how they reacted to it rather than get into, you know, every single detail of the politics because it's, you know, it comes up as it's important to them. And we made sure all of that was accurate. Okay. So yeah, Rob, no, go ahead. Jersey, please. Well, I was actually going to turn it 
to direct the the light towards you now and say like, okay, you also make things with your partner. Not, you do a podcast with your partner, but you've most recently made a workshop with your partner. So I wonder if you could talk about like what that looks like when you two are working together. Are there any similarities to what Ryan was describing or differences? Like, how does that look? Yeah, there's, uh, I guess, I mean, for us, it's, this was, if, when I hear Ryan's story, it sounds like um, there was, it's almost like, uh, I mean, like a journalist and then, you know, like mining and discovering and, and, and co-creating through uh, like a, a facilitation. And, and in this situation where we're with uh, Kate and I, we were both, uh, I would say, it was, it was, uh, we had, we had a moment as far as picking, like, who did we want to um, sort of like lay the conceptual foundation, right? And then proceed from there. So someone had to sort of get the thing rolling. And uh, we, we discussed and we wanted, uh, well, Kate to do that because of, I mean, quirks I've had in the past where I can, when I get on a certain project or if I, if I get on a deadline or whatnot, I can get, um, you know, I still think I'm a pretty, uh, fun, kind person to collaborate with, but I have a, uh, a sort of uh, expectation about getting the debt, meeting the deadline. Right. And, and I, and a sort of, I don't know, I, I don't want to use overly ridiculous words like severity about it, but like, I feel strong about like, let's figure out what we got to do to get to this deadline. And like we, like Kate and I experienced a lot of that. This is something we'll probably unpack more on like the art and science punks, but like when we collaborated on Babies Love Comics, that was, you know, there was a lot of my um, deadline pushiness stuff where, um, where it, it created a lot of um, uh, just, just a lot of collaborative tension as far as, well, my, practice and capacity and all my habits or whatever were compatible with the deadline stuff, but then, but where Kate, it was less so. So, so, and so it to sort of, well, to recognize that and not repeat it, right. Let's have, um, uh, basically the, the deadline and the flow of this project was driven based on, uh, Kate's timing. And so we would meet and collaborate and all that kind of stuff. And it kind of changed, uh, it changed the whole flow of it, right? I mean, which we've had lots of practice with collaborating on lots of things. We even look at um, our mental model for our relationship is a collaboration. Um, we we tackle like, but that's a different kind of collaboration, like a lifestyle versus an event, and like a creative event where you create an object and put it into the world is different than that, like the the ongoing lifestyle stuff. So we've got some of these practices we're really comfortable with, but like that making a specific thing we've been, you know, working on and getting better at. And the, uh, so this project, it was, that was a big influence to say, okay, um, timing and whatnot, uh, Kate drove that. And then when we would meet to work on this, um, it sort of would keep evolving and, and taking different shape as, you know, Kate went away and worked on that conceptual foundation. Cause it started out where we assumed we were going to make a, a workshop about goal planning, um, as a couple, right? So whoever your partner is and what have you, it's, it's, it's an interesting circumstance to say like, well, I know I want to get these things done in the next five years of my life, or I hope so, but really we're together. And now what I'm doing is affecting you and what you're doing is affecting me. How can we make that work well? Right. And I think there's lots of interesting conversations, but there's still like this fundamental thing that ended up popping up of, of saying like, well, we kind of have to, we kind of need to deal with individual goals first. And that was organic and came through the, you know, Kate exploring that and then us collaborating and this ebb and flow of that. And so let's see, that was, uh, let's. So I'm, I'm hearing there, that there was like different working styles that you guys had to sort of accommodate to one another on. Um, For sure. Yeah. And um, I, I, I want to go back to Ryan now. Like, did, did you, I mean, cause it's a little bit different when you're talking about band book club, because this is you sort of doing, um, telling the story of Hyun Suk's life and having conversations with her. But did, was there any, did, did you find there was any kind of like weird, um, differences of opinion or frictions when it came to, you know, like what Rob was describing with like, uh, working style. A t uh, attendance to deadline working hours i know this is something that ann sure. and i Output, like had page count yeah ann and i sort of had a lot of frictions when it came to that where like i 
I want to talk about it all the time. <laughs> and I was like, look, you know, can we just have dinner together? I'm like, no, <laughs> we're going to talk about this project night and day because this is all I care about right now. But um, did, did you run anything like that, Ryan? Yeah, that was exactly me. I was the one who wanted to talk about it 24 hours a day. And it was, it was funny where I'd, I'd, um, I'd ask her a question about a particular situation. She'd be like, oh, you already asked me about that. I'm like, yeah, I'm writing a book about it. Like, I got to we need i need like details i need like <laughs> memories and, um and like uh but yeah so for me like i the one thing i liked is like we we'd set certain time like we'd have uh just like a hot date i'm like let's have a, a book hot date i'll take you out we can get her like uh the best way to get stories out of her is you give her half a glass of wine that's all it takes <laughs> and she starts slaying like that and just tells me and then then she'd start spilling all the details and then okay. uh and then I'd have to like write down madly and the next day, like type everything up and show her like, is this what it was like? And then she would explain to it. But yeah, it was, um, and like, but yeah, you know, I would be the one that like every, we're climbing the mountain now we're, we're on the bus and I'm like talking about it and she's like, just chill, just chill, chill. <laughs> um, and, uh, and yeah, just always thinking about it. Like where, uh, um, like even things that she like she would be telling me completely unrelated to the book. Like that's another thing where working with your your partner is uh, a benefit in this case because like there are things that I knew just from like her telling me family gossip that like mm. she would never have told an interviewer. And I'm just like, oh, this is a metaphor for everything. And she's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, because she's telling me about her like her father running a steak restaurant and like how it fell apart because someone scammed them and this whole thing. And I'm like, uh, and I'm just keep asking questions. She's like, why are, is this going? In, this isn't going to the book, is it? I'm like, this is all going to the book. Absolutely. <laughs> she's like, what does my father's steak restaurant have to do with band book club? And I'm like, you don't understand. I'll show you. I'll show you. It's a metaphor for everything. It ties everything together. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was the one always thinking about it. Um, it was interesting seeing it switch though, because when we were working on the book, it was, it was uh, me always asking the questions. And then uh, we got a deal to adapt her book into Korean for a Korean release uh, with a publisher called Idea um, here. And um, so then luckily what was amazing is she got hired as a translator for her own book. And so um, like it was, I like I translated her story into English and then she translated it back into Korean and then, you know, and then she like seeing her read it so closely and like try to like figure out all the like nuance of what like what I was saying and how I was saying it, like asking. And then it was her asking me the same thing over and over. I'm like, you already asked me about that. She's like, yeah, I'm writing a book. <laughs> and uh, Yeah. So it, it like it, it was amazing seeing us exactly switch switch roles and like then like. I, I would start getting frustrated because like I, she'd ask like how to translate something. I'm like, I don't know. I'm not the trans. I can't speak <laughs> Korean and like try to explain it to her different ways and explain like what, because like one of the biggest things was just like when I had the characters speak like puns or uh, idioms that can't translate into Korean and then have to be like, this is why I put it in. This is what it means. And then have her try and, with her experiences say what her friends would have actually said. So it's, it's uh, interesting. Like it, it'll be like a, it'll be a different, slightly different experience for someone reading the book in Korean because the, a lot of things are changed in that way that give the same ideas, but without the puns or jokes that rely on English and also just her changing things to like better fit for a Korean audience or better relate to how she felt and things like that. So, oh, that's great. Yeah. That's really great. That's cool that like both reading experiences will be unique and sort of for those those audiences mm -hmm. um, of English and so speakers. primary so, from the co-authors, yeah. right? That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, it's like you're you you're able to do localization in in, in like two versions of the project um, from the primary team. That's really neat. Yeah, that is really. Yeah, neat. and that's something that uh, is like would be much more difficult if we you know we weren't husband and wife, and she could just like wake me up in the middle of the night and be like, what does this joke mean? Or, uh, you know, something like that. It's just being able to constantly go back and forth with each other and not like send an email, wait for an answer. And, you know, well, like and, a stranger. well, also like the, the stories of like being able to mine from like just different parts of her life and say like, Oh, that's a metaphor for this. Like, uh, 
your exposure to that person and your knowledge and your intimate knowledge of that person, but also like your um, the opportunities for attentive, teachable moments or findable moments in in your life with a person can yield like really rich stuff like that. Like for instance, in the rockets book, the whole narrative thrust of that book about uh, the, the history and science of rockets is told by the animals that participated in rocket history. Anne and I have done this in our shown this in our talks. It started with Anne sending me a video. I want to say in like 2005, um, it was a long time ago and I'll, I'll pull it up on uh, YouTube. Uh, it's the bear on a trampoline video. You guys seen this from ages ago. Um, yeah, it's muted. So, but it was like, uh, and, and you're not going to see it on the, the zoom video, but I'm, I'm streaming it on, um, Oh, let me stream it on, uh, Twitch. So yeah, it was this video of a bear that got uh, caught in a tree and then the firefighters tranquilize it and they put a trampoline under it so that the bear could like land safely. But it's this, it, and sent it to me because it was, uh, this whole idea of it's just, it's hilarious because it's a bear on a trampoline, but it's also like somehow like really tragic and awful because it's a tranquilized bear falling onto a trampoline and landing on the ground. So it like has that, that double kind of like feeling of like joy and, Oh, I, I don't know if I'm comfortable with this, you know? Um, and when oh, that was a it, journey. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> And so we show this when we do talks for uh, Rockets because, like, it's like it raises this whole idea of like how probably we're not always awesome at treating animals with respect, right? And we're and we're also like kind of ill-equipped to deal with that um, cognitive dissonance of oh, it's so funny, but it's so tragic at the same time, kind of thing. Um, but when we were doing when we were started like to come up with pitches for what the Rockets book would be, and had locked and loaded all these stories of like like animals in rocket history because of that video centered down this 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 intellectual journey of thinking about like our relationship with animals and that led to that pitch which led to the joke in the book where the grizzly bear is like uh talking about uh fighter jets in the 1950s and then these rats come in or monkeys come in and, and talk to him about how bears were used in ejector seat technology and he gets angry and walks off the book like that whole arc of storytelling was born out of like something that was just part of our own personal experience as husband and wife talking about things that fascinate us. Right. Um, we couldn't, we couldn't have planned for that. Right. So like, it's, it's one of the things I think is worth highlighting is like a cool thing about making something with your partner is, um, being attentive to and looking for all these like rich pieces of your relationship that can inform the creativity of the work itself. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. It's uh, serendipity. It's yeah. uh, it, it's it's the preparing for success as opposed to you know just trying to make the thing. It's, yeah. it's uh, you're 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 immersed in a situation and things are going to come out of it. Um, right. And that's so. Do you like what about? Well, let's see. What are some things that that you would you think that you learned from this this process? Um, as far it that that feedback into your um into your relationship. Uh, oh, you, yeah. Well, for me, uh, for me, obviously, just like knowing more about like knowing this entire side of my wife that uh, I had no idea about, like, obviously that this is a special case where you're learning things about your partner every single moment, because that's literally what you're writing about. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's um, I mean, I, I don't know that we. Uh, I mean, I guess she learned a lot about like what I do, obviously, like, I think that's kind of brought us together a lot, but, um, just like to back to what Jersey was mentioning about like, uh, things in your relationship that you can put into it that wouldn't work other ways. Like for me, just already knowing her parents, like was a huge impact on the book just because like, you know, like I, I'm not like creating a character. Like I know exactly what her, her her mother would do in any situation. Like I've, I've been in the house where she shows that up her house and tries to force me to eat beef, uh, because I'm a vegetarian. She thinks it's weird. And she drives, she takes a bus to our house with a bag of beef and screams at us to eat beef. Um, and then like that happens in the book, <laughs> she's pressuring people to eat beef. Um, and I know how to like, and I know like the things that frustrate my wife and how to like put those in the book with about while still making her mother, uh you know a lovable character um and so just i mean even just learning things about her her parents and like working with them on and interviewing them is like 
uh, like helped me get to know them a little bit better. So it's just kind of like really just learning people, all these things about my family that I didn't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and also I would say a big one for me too, was, um, learning to trust and respect, um, my wife's tastes and humor. Uh, something that I've enjoyed on a personal level, but suddenly it'd be when you start talking about like putting it into a work that's going to have my name on it too, and finding like a little bit of resistance, like I don't know, like that's that's a funny joke when we're having dinner together. Is that funny in a book? I don't know. And having that that argument to where it's like there's there's like one of the best jokes in the book, in my opinion, is when the polar bear turns to the reader and says it was a cold war, and then the the three animals faint. Um, and that was all Anne. I didn't, I actually kind of resisted it at first. I'm like, oh, that's kind of like a, it's kind of a bad pun, but I'm like, well, wait a second, 11 year olds, <laughs> you know, this is for 11 year olds. They're going to love it. And then, and sure enough, that's, we get feedback from 11 year olds. So like, that's really funny. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's like, I, I need to trust and respect my wife a little bit more than I thought I was. Um, and then finding out that there's other, I don't know, I don't know, just, I guess, yeah, that'd be the big one for me, is is, is having a deeper and richer uh, appreciation of who this woman is, because now we have to negotiate in this arena that I've spent a lot of time building my own identity around. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and I, I think of myself as a good collaborator. Well, it's, now it's time to really prove it. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is quite a quite a test of that. Um, there's, I, I think I have just echoing statements where maybe this is just sort of like one of the natural core things that's kind of it makes sense that it comes out of this is that through the collaborative process you you have a certain kind of vulnerability making a thing that represents both of you and all in in ideas that you're weaving together with some kind of sense of both expression and service and there's a there's no simple math for that process but there is a lot of um sitting with each other's creative vision and stuff right and so there's the vulnerability aspect but then for me i also um i get inspired it makes me you know uh seeing my wife perform and and get her ideas out and being attached to her ideas and vision and how she presents them and whatnot and and i'm like god that's going to help people i love this and I get inspired. Uh, yeah. It makes me want to try harder. Yeah, for for me, like with, with Band Book Club and the other book I'm working on right now, Culted, which is kind of a follow up to Band Book Club about a friend of mine who grew up in a cult. Um, that's something I really think about is like how, like, for me with these, my I I realize my role is to like step back and see how I can be in service of their story. Not so, you know, I, I inject what of mine helps it, but not like try and make it my thing. Um, Cause like, especially there's so within publishing, there's so much drama right now with things like American dirt. That's oh, a big yeah. thing right now about a book that like, is this your story to tell? Um, are you doing this accurately? Are you putting in stereotypes of what you think it might be? And so for me, like I, you know, I'm very upfront about the fact that, you know, I, Um, like with band book club, a lot of other authors might've interviewed my wife and then written their book. Um, I'm like, I I am absolutely not the person to be writing this book. I'm going to make her a co-author. And then same with Amy wrote, like I, I, I will never claim to know no matter how much research I do, what the experience of growing up in a cult is. Um, so I, let them take the lead and it was different in each case, how much I did, how much of my voice I put in, how much I stepped back, how much they did the actual physical writing, how much I did, because my role is not to make it mine. My role is to um, do the things that need to be done to make it good. Like with my wife, she's not a writer, so she couldn't sit down and like write the script. She doesn't know how how a comic script is structured. so like it, it was me physically sitting down and writing it and then showing it to her to make changes and suggest changes. Whereas with uh, Amy Rose with on occulted, like she is a writer who is unfamiliar with comic scripts. So um, it was more of like, she did a lot more of the physical writing and I would like help format it into a, uh, a comic and suggest like structural ways to make it work. But um, 
my job in both was very different because like like I said, it's not it's not uh, how can I use your flavor to use your story to flavor my book. It's how can I help you create your book? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really different, it, that's a different sounding stance because I think a lot of, um, uh, I mean, I'm, when I encounter sort of a, uh, like a biography or something, a lot of times it's the biographer, the writer, the, like, like the one who holds the pen is the one who claims the work. Mm -hmm. um, but this is, that's a really different stance. Like yeah, I mean, the, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, it just in this case, I'm lucky enough to be able to work with, with the, the people involved in the stories. Like, it, you know, if you're doing a biography of someone who's no longer with us, you don't have that luxury. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to take advantage of it and, you know, let these people tell their story as opposed to me, uh, like trying to take it and use it for what I want to say. Mm hmm. Uh, I feel like we're approaching a good point to take a quick break and then come back in the second half of the show and like maybe talk about some of the highs, some more about like the uh, the characteristics of working with your partner, highs and lows, frictions to that that we encountered, but then also joys of of uh, getting to work with the person closest to you. Um, so if you guys cool with that, take a, about a minute and a yep. half break. All right, Let's cool. So we'll come back in a minute and a half. Talk about that. Uh, and then maybe talk a little bit more about the two the two minute uh, practice that we've been doing this week. But before we do that, we've got to thank some people who make this show possible, and those people happen to be the folks who support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Lean Into Art is the website. What is it? Is a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. If you believe in me and Rob and the work that we do, you can support us for as little as a dollar a month. You can cancel any time, but I do advise you to stick around for at least a month just to enjoy all the extra free stuff behind the scenes. Uh, and I want to thank five people who have been supporting us on a regular basis. First up, Cameron Callahan. Thank you, Cameron, for believing in us and what we do. You can find Cameron on Twitter at Cam Callahan. Also, Jonathan Warrenson. Thank you, Jonathan. It means a lot to us. And Mike White. You can find Mike White on Instagram at Mike White Robot. Thank you so much, Mike. And J.S. Taskus. You can find J.S. on Twitter at J.S. Taskus. And finally, The Mysterious K. Thank you so much for supporting us. You can join them all at patreon.com slash lean into art, where you will find all the shows we make, as well as the extra leans, the shows we record only for people who support us on Patreon. Those posts become an open mic thread where you talk about whatever you want in a safe place uh, where only fellow leaners are hanging out. And supporting us on Patreon also gets you access to the Lean Into Art Discord private uh, channels, which we'll talk about more at the end of this episode. But once again, patreon.com slash leading to art is the website thank you to everybody who supports us there it means a lot to us it sure does okay thank you and how about just hit some very short music to take us into the next half because we were talking about science comics rockets and there we go now we're in the second half let's talk about highs and lows of working with uh, navigating frictions and celebrating the joys. Um, I don't know about you guys. I, I, I think I heard a little bit of this in the stories you were telling, but uh, and it resonated with me because I know that one of the things I encountered with making something with my wife was discovering um, unknown baggage that I was carrying about myself as a cartoonist that wouldn't have come out in another uh, collaborative partnership because the level of knowledge and understanding of one another wouldn't be there, right? I've known Anne for 20, oh, going on 25 years, you know, uh, been married as, as of this year, 20 years. So she knows more about me than anybody, right? And like, Having having that level that deep knowledge made it made her able to call me out on things when we were arguing over different parts of the book that I wouldn't have. I think another collaborative partner wouldn't have picked up on, right? And so, like it was, it, there was incredible opportunities for growth presented to me <laughs> by virtue of the fact that my wife was there to say is this really about your knowledge as a cartoonist and your skills as a cartoonist? Or is this about this life experience that I'm detecting similar, you know, resonances with? And I was like, no, maybe. <laughs> Did you guys encounter anything like that? Uh, well, for me, uh, 
one thing I, I realize is how like obsessed with story I am above all else. Like that's, that's what my, how my mind tracks anything is with story. Like one of the funny situations was when my wife was first telling me the story, like I said, it's because she had met some friends and she met like an old boyfriend from college. And she's talking about like, tell me the story of like being in the band book club together. And this like this one romantic night they had on a, on a boat and like it's the most romantic story in the world. And like, they almost kiss, but they don't. And, <laughs> And then like, and then she's talking about how like, um, <clears throat> tells me all this stuff. And then like, yeah, we met last week and like we reunited after this many years. And I'm like, did you kiss? And she's like, <laughs> no, we're, we're married. And I'm like, oh, it would have been a better story if you kissed at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Which just, just, that's how my brain works. It's, I'm, I'm like, it's like I'm watching a movie. <laughs> like, it's just, ah. <laughs> <sighs> oh. That's good. That's good. Uh, <laughs> deeper self knowledge is always a good thing. Uh, <laughs> when you find out that you're obsessed with the story, Rob, anything like that happened between you and Kate while you guys were working together? Um, did you Did well, you I ask mean, her to kiss other men? <laughs> no, that wasn't a, an implicit nor explicit request. Um, it uh, what happened? Uh, it it was this is a, a, kind of a series of collaborations, right? So we've we've been doing our podcast together, and then this this has been uh, we've we've been building to doing some kind of products in the form of workshops and 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 helpful other materials like the like the workbook, right? We knew this was coming. It just was a really a question of like, well, how are we going to go about it this time? And that. Um, the idea of like how do we how do we manage our own commitments to this and uh, communicate that back and forth with each other and that that's um, and that's where we came up with that sort of like a looser grip on the, the the timeline and it's more of sort of a a lob the ball back and forth rhythm and then you know the ball just would, would keep being the project would keep evolving over time. And so we have a lot of dialogue during one of those lobs, right? So it's like, we're investing time, same time, same place. And let's move it forward. And then hold on to then then just sit back and, and maybe we each carry away some kind of, you know, concern to follow up on. But but for the most part, it, you know, figuring out that core concept, it was uh, that was Kate. And uh, oh the rhythm of that ball, like the, the, the progression or heartbeat of the project, instead of saying, well, every week it's going to be this and we expect progress every week. It, it was a lot more loose. <laughs> so that arrangement um, was what it made it a lot easier for me to, to not be. Um, yeah. Creating a, uh, cause even if you're comfortable with failing, it's um, if you keep failing every single week, uh is it does it stay fun <laughs> um it's hard to really frame that in a way where yeah it's still exciting even though yeah okay we've we have um either of us has missed like 5 10 12 you know whatever n number of deadlines it's like well what if we just got rid of that <laughs> and that was that was a lot to, uh I don't know. It's just a lot more helpful. It's like positive reinforcement, focusing on the thing that's moving us forward instead of uh, the thing we are doing, not the thing we're not doing. Oh that was, yeah. That was a big thing. Huh? Um, so, I mean, uh, let's, let's talk about deadlines a little bit. Like how did you guys, it's like, this gets in this whole idea of like something I struggled with personally when we were doing the rockets book was, is like, I'm used to managing myself um, now I'm a collaborator with somebody and, I, and I'm, I'm used, I've collaborated with Anne on small projects before where the deadline like was really short. It, it wasn't a year. It was like a month, you know, and I've worked with other collaborators before, uh, where, but when I worked with other collaborators, there was much more of a professional sort of front end built in by virtue of the fact that we don't know each other as well as I know my wife. Um, so something that became a challenge to figure out really quickly was, how do we find a way to work together on something where there is an external deadline being put upon us? This 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 material is due at this time. Like we had a, like a schedule, like thumbnails are due at this time, pencils are due at this time, inks are due at this time, and so on. Um, I wonder if you guys could both speak to that. Like, what did that? What did that? Uh, how did you guys 
negotiate that together. And it sounds like with with you you and Kate, Rob, you guys said like, hey, how about we just focus on what we're accomplishing rather than what what deadlines we're not meeting. Um, Which was a luxury because we were self-publishing this. Yeah, okay. But what about you, Ryan? Because you had a, uh, you're working with a publisher and I'm gathering, I, I assume there was some kind of deadline put upon you. Yeah, absolutely. What well, the benefit we had is, um, Iron Circus is an amazing publisher. Spike is an amazing publisher. Very slow at answering emails. <laughs> so we had the benefit of like, while we were waiting for the contract, like we just worked and it uh. took like six months. So like we signed the contract. We're like, oh, we're almost done with the script. <laughs> like, okay. And so that we got that. Luckily, the work I got with Hyunza, we got so far ahead was we were doing the interviews and everything that um, the, it was just a little bit of like we we finished the script we sent to the um to the editor and kind of went back and forth on that a little bit and then like we so we didn't really have much worry about with that collaboration and then we had uh i didn't draw the book i had a korean artist do it because i wanted a korean artist to draw a korean story and then the the deadline was more about his work um Mm. and then i i there was a crunch there was a crunch at the end where i was trying to um like help, I was helping out and working on a lot of things with him, but Hyunsuk wasn't involved in that. So our our bit was very kind of easygoing, not not too much stress. Uh, later, she had uh, more of a deadline crunch when she was doing the, the Korean translation because it had to be done pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, you know, she she uh, managed that pretty well. There wasn't much help I could give because I can't translate but more mostly just answering her questions so there's no issues for us on that on that front did did do you guys um and I'm, I'm asking both rob and ryan did you guys do like um scheduled blocks of time to like this is where we the the area where we talk about or work on this thing or was it more distributed i mean because like when you were talking earlier ryan about like i want to talk about this all the time um something that Anna and i sort of had to negotiate was in order to like you know uh, remind ourselves that we're human beings who are also married partners and we're not, that I'm not a cartoonist 20, 24 seven, you know, uh, was like negotiating like, okay, this block of time on these days is going to be time where, you know, we're going to show up and talk about this stuff. So if you're thinking about it during the week, save it up and bring it to those, uh-huh. those sessions together. Um, and we even did, and this is actually one of the things that I would point as one of the joys of working with your partner is um, we, we, negotiated that uh for at least like six months of the project when we were doing like a lot of the research our date nights were going to the library and just reading together like reading as much about rocket history as we could for months and months um and so we baked that into our lives as a scheduled sort of bit of business but did you did you guys do do that with your collaborative projects or rob you're nodding uh right i mean so for for kate and i we have two kids and uh Mm -hmm. You know, so between, you know, kids and other professional commitments and whatnot, uh, like the calendar is a big deal <laughs> for us. We, we coordinate a lot through uh, scheduling uh, appointments with one another or negotiating time to, to, to do that. And then so there's typically a few different windows where we have that time that like where we could let the project just either um, like unintentionally just spill into stuff, but it wouldn't work out well in the midst of making supper with kids and for kids and stuff, it just, the, it, you know, a little bit of spice and chaos is fun and, and could really, you know, kick up some creative energy. But I think I wouldn't remember anything. It'd be confusing and frustrating to like really try to get stuff done during many yeah. times with, with, uh, with all, all the kids around, but then it's like, well, when the kids are in bed and then sometimes we have, um, you know, time to watch something together or do our podcast or whatever. Uh, but then we also, um, we, we both uh, became certified coaches in that, in that same time frame. So like we were doing um, a lot of scheduling with time working on our, our, our side projects together. And um, like, so yeah, we were very intentional about it. And the, the, the mixed bag of it was, is we traded like uh, a lot of times we, we would have, a, we have a pretty consistent weekly date night yet um and normally that would be pretty pretty much either take care of a couple errands for for the house and stuff and or uh just do something fun and spend time together talk with whatever that became filled 
And it was sort of like, we kind of already had the time set aside and it got used for all the project stuff. <laughs> so now we're start kind of getting back to like, oh, now we do other things. We're not just, you know, talking about school and the project all the time. Ryan? Yeah, for, for us, it, you know, it, for me doing the English version, her doing the Korean version, there was really only one of us at the keyboard at once. So it wasn't like we were trying to collaborate like all this mostly for most of us, it was uh, uh, for her role in the English and my role in the Korean was uh, asking questions or answering questions and checking over drafts. So um, for like small questions, it would, it was easy just to be like one of us would be typing and then yell out a question in the next room. And I'd, I'd be like, uh, Hyunsuk, did you ever throw a Molotov cocktail or was it just your friend? Or she'd be like, what is, what is a, um, I just can't remember a pun. So what does this pun mean? Um, but then, we, you know, when one of us would finish a draft and want the other to check it over, we just, you know, I, I'm lucky enough to like work on like 40 projects at once at any given time. So I, mm -hmm. I would just finish something, send it to her. She'd take her time getting to it, reading it making her notes and I'd be working on Star Trek or working on Popeye or something like that. And, uh, nice to be able to go back and forth. So, um, we, we, you know, we, there was times where she'd just be like, uh, you know, we'd be doing something else and she, I'd be asking a million questions like Ryan, just chill, just chill. So like, it, it wasn't like planned. We don't talk about it here. We don't talk about it here, but like when she's like, I'm trying to relax right now, we're at the, you know, we're, we're on, we're taking a weekend trip. Just, I don't want to talk about that right now. She just let me know in the moment and I'd okay. save my questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no more yeah, questions. It, it, what, what are my unexamined uh, sort of fantasies about like working with my wife on projects was like, Oh, it's gonna be like Charles and Ray Eames and our entire house is just going to be like this, this, um, temple of creativity creativity happens everywhere like you guys have both been to my place back when i lived in ann arbor like we had like chalkboards all over the walls and like there was just like there's places to capture ideas and play all over the place and like that was that was really intentional and, th and thought through by both of us but like i think sometimes uh i wanted it well it's like it's something you were talking about uh earlier rob about like this idea of like a spontaneity you can add spice and it's like it's like the same idea with like romance in a marriage it's like oh it's like it's a never-ending love affair well <laughs> it's also scheduling and it's minutia it's take the garbage out and it's like all of these like these these like keeping doing the business of staying alive kind of stuff and like i remember thinking like this like 10 12 years ago now when I, the moment I had to buy a calendar, you know, like actually like keep a calendar on my person. I was like, this is the saddest thing that's ever happened to me. You know, like I'm not, I'm not a real artist anymore. I'm like, I'm a stupid grown up now. Um, but like, I, I think about that, like in terms of our, the, this project is like, I had that romantic idea that we're just going to be endlessly generating creative thought together and neglecting the fact that like, oh yeah, there's times where you just want to chill out and you just want to be a person and not have to think about this project all the time. Um, and yeah, actually it's probably a good idea if we actually schedule it. So then we have like a, a mental exercise, to like spin up to this thing, like you do for a meeting and like, there's like, um, anyway, yeah, it's, it's, it was, it was sort of me coming to grips with that. I, the moment I thought about our names being together on a book, I was like, we're going to be just like Charles and Reams. There's gonna be pictures of us on a motorcycle together, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but ain't necessarily. So can, can we talk about, um, uh, so a friend of mine once described like a, a partnership or domestic partnership or a marriage as like, instead of you walking side by side, you're sort of walking like this, you're leaning into one another and relying on each other's strengths. And I think that's a really lovely thought. Um, and I'm wondering if, if you guys encountered anything like that, like discovering or reacquainting yourself with how you wind up leaning on each other through the way you have to rely on each other's strengths in a creative project together. Did anything like that happen in your experience? Ryan? Um, I can't think of any examples of it. Uh, yeah, just like, like I said, it, it was a lot for her discovering what I do and um, realizing and like her kind of uh, leaning on that, but then me like leaning on her for needing like, like uh, there's no way I could have done the research necessary because I don't speak Korean. Um, and having her uh, explain a lot of it, you know, me, I can read a book, but her explaining 
how the history felt to people in the time. Like it's very different, you know, like an English speaking, uh, uh, his, uh, you know, historian explaining the context of it as opposed to like, this is what it felt in the moment and then interviewing people and talking to them about uh, how it, like what their lives were like, I could never have done that. And mm-hmm. she's constantly like, you need to, you need to learn Korean. And I'm like, yes, I do. I know. <laughs> but um, so it's, it was nice. Both of us bringing something to, to it. Like she could not have, you know, written a comic script and I could not have done the research. So for both of us together, uh, it made it happen. But there, there's there's also the fact that like you have this obsession with finding story wherever mm-hmm. you're looking, right? And the fact that you have your yeah. eye on that, and the fact that she was she was there to provide you with. I'm going to spill out on all the table all the details, and then mm-hmm. you could le- lean in and say, "Okay, thank you for all the details. I'm going to like sort out and figure out where the patterns emerge and find where the story is and all of this mm-hmm. uh, information." Um, I mean, I feel like that that's that's an example of both of you bringing a different strength to the table. She's providing the, the, yeah. the, the firsthand accounting and experience and perspective, and you're finding the sort of the through lines through all of that, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, yeah, where does it start? Where does it go? Where did, How do I fit them together so it's not just little vignettes and things like that? Yeah. I, I, another really awesome takeaway that I, that I hear in there is um, this idea that we all think of our lived experience well we all i'm not going to talk about all of us i can't speak for everybody but like i know for, for myself i think of my lived experience as being like there's no way i would put that in a book because it is so utterly uninteresting right and there's certain stories that i've told about my childhood when i tell them those friends they're like that should be in a book i'm like I, I, what are you talking about you know and it's it's encouraging to hear your story about like talking to your wife who had this inter- interesting experience, but because she grew up in the time she did and where she did, it's like, yeah, this happened to a bunch of us. And you know, I don't know, it's just a thing that happened. It's an anecdote, you know, but like there may be um, more to it. If you find, if you find yourself a Ryan Estrada who can get really excited about whether or not you kiss a dude, you shouldn't kiss, you know, <laughs> find that person to like get excited about the stories you tell. Rob, yeah, that recognition. So, yeah, it's it's um it's it's interesting that um there's almost like it's like a collaborative flow of of like the the passing and and, and incrementally growing in ideas. What I hear, and that that's um, yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty great. And then like just the recognizing the stories and whatnot. That's uh, it's very complimentary, right? Where um, sometimes I uh, I. I don't know. I have a way of looking at things that probably this is a tension that I know that comes up sometimes is I like to think this is a weird privilege. Um, Cause I can, I'd like to excuse myself and wander away from it saying it's great. Shut up. But what it is, is I sometimes get in the mindset of thinking everyone can do what I can do. Right. Mm. It's like, if I can do it, you could do it. I believe yep. in you. Right. Yep. Yep. And that has, positive aspects to it and it has negative aspects to it and then uh so really believing and that that others if they cared to or try or grow or whatever but there's so much more to it as far as you know uh access and availability and and uh motivation all this kind of stuff has to you know come together at the same time and and then it's like well okay possibly i get that it's more complex than that kind of like how where it comes up in uh at times, I couldn't, there, maybe there's a cyclical pattern to it. I haven't detected it, but I believe everyone can draw for better or for worse. And uh, a lot of times, uh, Kate will, will sort of do something, uh, uh, visually capture an idea and then and go, aha, look it, I can't draw. And I'll, I'll go, aha, look it, you can draw. <laughs> With the same evidence proving both of our cases. Yeah. And uh so with with this project, it's a you know it was really more about the meta and um, and being able to and so like how do we you know do we lean toward each other? I guess our metaphor is more um, we sort of uh, are collectively holding this thing that is our relationship, and we're continuing mm-hmm. to to build that. And then I guess then we chose to build another th- another thing as a, <laughs> this product too. So. <laughs> being careful with all this stuff that we're carrying. Um, 
but being attentive to that and ourselves individually and, and together. Um, but I th and, and also just uh, recognizing this, this history of quirks that we've, we noticed that we, each of us have, um, then that tends to help. It's like, well, our, in a way, like why we're, what we're carrying is this conversation and, and, and set of experiences that we share together in our regular life and the business of life. And also when we make stuff and, and, and wearing the different hats that we wear. Um, that's all context that feeds into like, oh, is it a good idea to be pushy now about a deadline? Or how could we best um, critique this thing that we we both worked on the draft of to, to make better, right? So we've got this workbook. Um, what's a good next step as far as is making it sure that it's, um, uh, it's clear enough or whatever, which, or how, what visuals need to go in it or whatever. And, uh, and just, I don't know, approaching that pretty much in the, in the way that, that I described before, where, you know, maybe we work on that together and, or maybe we, we say, we just take break off pieces of it and say, we'll come back together later. And, and, um, that, uh, so the, there's a lot, we've got a lot of practice doing that and teaming up on stuff. And so we've, um, and managing our own quirks, right? So my quirk of the whole, like, you know, we said we do it by this time, figure we, we just adapt. I don't know. The, like it just <laughs> let's improvise it right now. We, you know, and, or whatever it will do, you know, it's, it, it, my, my assumptions are that, that just, that, that don't always fit. Um, I'm aware mm. of that. <laughs> so so yeah. I'm a little better at managing that. Yeah. I think one of my assumptions is not just everyone can do this, but everyone wants to do this. <laughs> Whereas I'm like, <laughs> and, and, and I'm just like, I'm constantly asking my wife, like, what's your next project? Your, your project's a big, what's, what's your next book? She's like, I don't want to write another book. I, I only made that one because you pressured me into it. Like, she's just like, it's, she's so nonchalant about the whole thing. But she, I mean, she, she loved doing it, but she's like, okay, I, I, that, that was the book that I made. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, that, that is good. Yeah. And I mean, that's, I related to that thought is I think it's worth noting that all of us are speaking from a perspective of having finished the thing, right? Like it, it feels very different to be on the other side of it. Cause when you're in the thick of it, holy cow, is it intense? You're just trying not to drown. And like, uh, Nate is in the chat and was saying, um, uh, this is related to like when you're in the thick of it, you know, it's like with our lifestyles and all the projects and the kids, et cetera, the metaphor I use is that we are more often than not in the foxhole together, not entirely positive, but pretty accurately describes the feeling of being in the partnership. Yeah. Sometimes, and especially when you're in the thick of the making of the thing, it feels like, and even when you're doing a book that has like a pretty big deadline, like, you know, it took us a year and a half to do rockets, but that was a year and a half of like really intense thoughtful problem solving in various different stages of production of the book right um and uh yeah and 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 discovering um i was so grateful to ann because because of her deep knowledge of me that there were moments where i was ready to take a stance on certain elements of the book like you know like arguing with like the editor and, and whatnot about like i think that this should be this way for this reason and Anne was there to be to say, like, look, I know you, and I think what's happening here is this is you being proud of your deep knowledge of storytelling. Is it really that big of a battle to fight? Is it really that important to like like is this the is this the hill you want to die on? Is this one particular panel? And I was like, oh yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. I'm just getting I'm getting prideful, and you know this has nothing to do with uh, affecting the overall quality of the book, and it will make our life more harmonious with our editor because we'll agree on something. Let's just proceed, you know. Um, but yeah, um, I, li I like this idea of, of also of discovering those blind spots of like, well, if I can do this, of course, everybody can do this, which is like another way of saying, um, I'm not doing anything that special, right? It's like, and that's like the opposite end a, of that. Yeah. A variety of positive side effects and a variety of negative side effects. And, but then also the thought, the thought that like, well, if I want to do this, then surely this is the most important and most... I'm guilty. I'm not accusing you of this, Ryan. I'm accusing myself of this. It's like, this is the noblest pursuit. 
a- afforded to mankind. <laughs> and if you don't care the way I care about this, I have no time for you. Get out of my sight, you know? Yeah. Like, that voice is in here, and it, it, it gets very angry sometimes. But it, it's related to this idea of, like, well, why wouldn't you want to do this? It's the greatest thing in the world, yeah. right? <laughs> well, uh, a funny, a funny thing that happened because of that is um, when you when we did the book, uh, the publisher sent us a questionnaire to fill out for uh, the promotion team about like availability for doing interviews and what we want to do. And like, and so when I asked Hyunsuk again, she's like, I don't want to write. Like, I, I don't need to promote myself. I'm not going to write another book. And also, like, I don't speak English is my second language. I don't want to be doing interviews. You can handle that. So just just put that you know that you can do all that so in the in the thing it like introduce yourselves i said you know i did but my bio and then i said i'm filling this out my myself instead of hyunsuk because she said this is her only book and uh i forget how i phrased it i didn't realize that that uh form that little block of text is what they were going to copy and paste as our biographies oh. in <laughs> in everything it, it's been changed since but so then later oh i go to <laughs> so then later i go on to amazon and it says ryan estrada is a cartoon artist adventure blah blah blah, blah. this is hyunsuk's only book <laughs> Ooh, yeah <laughs> and i'm like and i'm like oh my god it looks like i'm begging my wife and then i guess that and then when we got flown out to the american library association um I guess that bio had gone out some, I don't know where it was, but all the questions are like, is this really your only book? I'm like, yeah, this is what everyone knows about her. They know nothing except this is Kensuk's only book. It's like very like JD Salinger esque. Like she's some hermit. Like you're not allowed to know anything about me. I had assumed oh. bios were a thing I was going to write later for the book. I didn't know that was. The, that was right. It. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oh, I, I like the idea of like like creating this air of mystique around it inadvertently, though. Like the yeah. mysterious young Sook is here. There she is. There she is. <laughs> Don't talk to her. <laughs> she's 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 a, she's a total misanthrope. Doesn't want to have anything to do with us librarians. Uh, uh, that's I mean that's an intense artist vibe, though. That's pretty great. Like this is yeah. my only book, and then yeah, uh, yeah that's so awesome. Um, <laughs> but uh, okay. Well, let's see. What do you think as far as uh, um, where where do you want to go next with with our exploration jersey? Because I think um, I mean we've got yeah we're closing in. Topic. We've got our two minute practice segment potentially, mm-hmm. but I'm I'm open to you know. Well, well, go ahead, Ryan. Well, I can add uh, w- one of the positives I think about oh. working with your spouse uh, is like <clears throat> the ability to like uh, for promoting it because like artists have this thing everyone's afraid to promote themselves. Like it feels kind of icky and I've gotten good at faking it. Like I know I have to promote things. So I pretend that I'm, I'm, I don't feel weird about it, but I do. Um, and what, that's one of the things that I, I love about collaborating with people is that I can genuinely be like, this book's amazing. It looks awesome and not feel weird. Cause I'm promoting my uh, collaborators. But also if it's like just an artist you've worked with, it also feels weird to constantly talk about how great a stranger, you know, not a stranger you've worked with them, but just mm-hmm. like talk about how great this person is. It, you're like, have I said it too much? Is it going to be weird? Yeah. Whereas like yeah. with, with, with my wife, it's my job to talk about how great my wife is. I have no problem <laughs> going on every podcast in the world and going on Twitter and being like, my wife's book is cool. Like it's, <laughs> yeah. it's uh, so that's why like, I'm able to promote this book a lot more without feeling weird about it. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it it should be one's vocation to, uh, you know, at uh, promote and celebrate their significant other, right? <laughs> and yeah, you're right. Like that is that is a wonderful little bit of business I get to do when we're talking about rockets. Is like, oh, that part you like that was all Anne. She is so great. She's the best. and it, like and it's absolutely sincere, right? Like I really feel this way about her. There's like no cognitive dissonance between me and the the self promotion in that situation. Yeah, that is that is a really awesome advantage to point at. Um, work with your partner. Yeah, it's like. So uh, working with your partner so you can experience the benefit of secondary self-promotion. <laughs> well, that's the other part is like, is like, is like uh, if, if she suddenly becomes way more uh, successful at, than me at making comics, it's like, I win. 
<laughs> my wife's super successful at making comics that I get to be there to like celebrate her and celebrate comics, you know? Um, I would love if, if Hyunsuk got more famous than me as an artist and just watching her. Oh, I don't want to make another comic. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty inspiring, honestly. <laughs> and, uh, it's like I, I just like ah, I've been trying so hard. Look at this. I get to I get to be next to this person who is making it happen, and mm-hmm. with this, with uh, wonderfully artistic skill and reluctance at the same time. <laughs> yeah, well, like yeah, that that's a, another thing that I realized. Like I like I said, I, I don't know if it's going to become New York times bestseller, but based on sales, like we, we heard there's a possibility and I'm, wow. I'm, I'm excited about the possibilities of me being a New York times bestselling selling author, but I'm much more excited about the possibility of her who does not care at all. <laughs> like after reading all the articles about like the shady ways, powerful people are like buying their way into the list, like spending hundreds of thousands of dollars and doing illegal things to get themselves on the list. If my wife, who does not care accidentally becomes a New York Times bestselling author. I will be so excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. So, um, okay, how about we take one more break and then we can conclude with some thoughts on the two minute um, practice and then we will let Ryan go to bed because it is what going on? It's after three o'clock in the morning, your time, right? Yep. Yeah. Indeed. Oh my gosh. Mm. We appreciate you making the time to be here, Ryan. Yeah, um, always talk about comics. Cool. And I think we can bring it, uh, do, do another, um, like, I'd be curious to hear Ryan's thoughts about the, the two-minute practice, too. Oh, and cool. Of course, and we'll close up with uh, promoting and all that stuff. Great. Okay, so in about two minutes, we're going to conclude with the two-minute uh, practice. And before we do that, we got to thank some more people who make this show possible. Those people, our, our, our us we make this show possible and we make stuff and then we bring those thoughts that, have, that occur when we make stuff to become topics of these episodes the thing that i'm making that i hope you will check out right now is another podcast i do called the four million four million years later podcast and it is very different than lena to in the sense that it is about a pop culture thing it's about a cartoon from the 1980s called the transformers where me and a buddy are watching an episode a week and then getting together to talk about it and the way it's similar to lena to art is that it is um, I go into some really like heavy duty thinking, oh, possibly overthinking about these episodes. Uh, episode seven, fire God, in the sky. Is, overthinking what? doesn't exist. I That's you, true. Did you mean to say um, very analytical um, exploration of an, a story that inspires you deeply? Yeah, there you go. That's a great <laughs> way of saying that? it. Yeah. Not to put words in your mouth. But but yeah, the, the premise is, is that we're talking deeply about the story from the perspective of how we encountered it as a young person and how we feel about it today. Um, and episode seven is, is the longest one yet. It's like an hour and 40, hour and 42 minutes. And it's I go very, very long and hard about uh, how much I love the character of Skyfire and why in this particular story. So you can find it at four million years later dot com. Rob, it's a great you, episode to start your start listening to the podcast, to be honest. Oh, so, Oh, that's right. You listen. Well, thank you for doing that, Rob. Um, Rob, you made a workshop with your partner. I did. Yeah. So uh, Kate Shield Stenzinger, my uh, collaborator and creative partner and partner in other aspects of life as well. Uh, we made this workshop and workbook uh, that's called Goal Setting Using Design Plus Storytelling. That's the that's the big, that's a workshop that includes the workbook. Uh, the workbook is called The Where Next Journal. You could use either or both to do some base, some some uh, wrapping your head around strategy and tactics. Like where do you want to go next? And how could you tell that as a story? And um, that's like the, the big picture stuff, which is pretty powerful. It's neat to just remember where you're going in a, in a story that it gets you excited. And you can use that to help recruit other people and collaborators if you want for things you're building. That's pretty neat. But then there's also the tactics of, of like, well, what's what do you need to do right immediately next to just move you closer to that? And you can keep that going. So it's it's to, to set you up like any sort of um, goal planning, life planning kind of uh, system. Um, it, but it's it's meant to be sort of bite-sized, simple, and try to tackle a variety of ways of thinking and looking at where you want to go. Um, but through essentially six core activities or seven, if you get the full version. Full version of the Where Next Journal comes with both the comes with the workshop, um, and it also uh, is 
purchasable on its own. So if you go to uh, gum.co slash WNXTJ, you can get the journal. The free 10-page version is available for you there. You can get the full 30-page version as well for a small price. And then if you would like the whole experience of like, hey, someone walk me through this. Yeah, the workbook's handy and stuff and has a lot of explanation and warm-ups and stuff in it. But like, uh, what is it like to hear other people thinking through this? Well, we've got a 28 minute video for you. So um, it's in sections, like for each little section of the workbook and you can go through it with us. And that's at gum.co slash G-S-U-D-S. G suds. If you have purchased it, please consider giving it a rating. Um, that helps more people determine whether or not they want to avail themselves of this workshop. Um, and then the last thing we want you to check out is the Lean Into Art Discord. Yes, we have a forum now where you can hang out with other leaners. There are three public channels, topic requests where you can you know, suggest the ideas for the future shows, comment on past shows, and then you can also post your challenges and quests like the two-minute uh practice sessions that we've been doing. And then there's three channels that are only for people who support us on Patreon. So the invite link will be in the uh, show notes for this episode at leanintort.com and patreon.com slash leanintort and on the YouTube channel as well. So, okay. Two minutes to talk about the two minute uh, practice. You want to you wanna bring us back up to speed on what that is, Rob? Sounds great. So we introduced the two-minute practices a couple episodes ago. And the basic idea is creative challenges are awesome and a neat mechanism that you can use to to, to grow uh, skills and create products. And uh, But they're kind of expensive overall compared to something if you just want to do a quick warm-up. And creative challenges can really balloon and you can get into a lot of tension with the availability to, to make it happen and among all your other responsibilities. But you can get a lot of those benefits by just doing little practices that just practice small things frequently. And so we've got a, um, a way that we're going about that called uh, the Lean Into Art Two Minute Practice Sessions. And we've brainstormed a whole bunch of ideas that, that uh, are that are options for you to practice but of course you can use two minutes to brainstorm your own ideas for what you want to practice next and then just go about it schedule the time do the thing look back on it after that practice or just maybe after seven days of it either way and that way you are continuing to move forward trying stuff that you maybe normally wouldn't do it's like hey two minutes go for it find a find a spot in your schedule where that can fit and do a thing um, like our latest practice was art meditations. Mm -hmm. And so how do you look at art meditations, Jersey? Um, well, I'll pull up one of my art meditations that I shared on the discord. And basically I just open up my sketchbook. I take a pencil and, um, just move the pencil around. Uh, you described it as algorithmic drawing, which I like that idea of, um, the objective is to just make shapes that I like to draw, but the moment they start to form any kind of cohesive idea or representation, change tactics, change what you're you're doing. So I'm doing a lot of smooth shapes right now. It's starting to look like I'm making like a cloud field. All right, we're going to change the straight shapes. All right, we're just going to fill in like with the side of the pencil kind of thing. And um, the whole idea is to draw without any explicit purpose or objective. Um, it's a meditation, right? Um, so that's what I did all week. Did you do the same? I have a different thing. I wrestled with the core idea of this <laughs> because what I've been trying to buy into is that I can practice with no output that is expected uh, to do to do anything with almost saying implying to myself that if I make something that I think would be worth sharing or keeping it violates it. And then mm. I looked at the list that I brainstormed and I also looked at some of the things I was making and I thought, well, that's baloney because the whole point for, I think what works for me is that I'm going to practice and whatever comes of it comes of it. I'm just going to keep practicing. Mm. And so I could, cause I'd like, I'm attracted to like your, your, the, how you think about this where you're like, Oh yeah. Uh, if it becomes something, then, then switch and whatever. Um, but I ended up doing a lot of um, sort of large. I took, I wanted to do meditative drawing where I fill a page, but I made the page large and I wanted to do big motions. And so I, I picked bigger brushes. I used inks, um, little acrylic inks. And so I would spray inks on the page or I would start with, with a little palette that I put some, a little bit of um, squirt some ink into. And then I would brush it onto the page timed using a song 
that I know where I'm at in the two minutes because of the song, right? Mm -hmm. And all that stuff added up to, I was creating output that I wanted to create. That like I was trying to fully make some interesting work in that time and sometimes wandered toward that. Other times it was just filling the space. And also, so it felt like, and it wasn't as meditative. It was intense because <laughs> I was making these big motions to fill this page. And it was like a fast, intense workout. I felt great and energized after it. But like, it, so there's all these things where like I had assumptions and it went different and I like how it went. <laughs> and so I, I was arguing with myself when I was reflecting on this saying like, well, didn't I just sort of break the rules and all that? And I'm like, well, maybe that's just the point is that the two minutes is affordable and it's a space to go play with yeah. whatever happens. You don't have to walk away from play saying like, well, that was worthless. Excellent. Or <laughs> that was, you know, this will only uh, have out benefits in a year from now. Uh, that's excellent. But if it's like, Oh, psh, wait, this actually looks all right. Ah, boo. I don't want to discourage that. So right. anyway, that was my wrestling with the two minutes. Well, I think that if if your worry is that uh, making something that you're going to use later adds a stress to it that takes away from it, the stress of worrying that the thing you make might come back <laughs> is probably taking more away from it than the possibility <laughs> of using it later. Yeah. Uh, that's an excellent way to put it. And I was, well, that's exactly what I was wrestling with. <clears throat> I mean, and, and for further context, I mean, I'm bringing some personal baggage to this in that Rob, I think, very accurately pointed out last week that I have a habit of trying to hack creative challenges to make a pro use it as product development. And so I've always got my eye on how is this something that I can help create signal for future projects that I want to get attention for? Um and also, can I have something that's shippable that I can package up? Like, so last October, I did a, in 31 days, I put together a pitch for a graphic novel, right? Um, I'm always doing that. So it was like, okay, well, let's step away from that altogether, right? Like, let's give myself a constraint where I'm really not trying to make anything shareable. And instead, so if you want to talk about reflecting on last week's uh, challenge, uh, practices, is that it was... I encountered resistance where I rolled my eyes that, oh, that's right, I got to do that two minute thing today, you know, and then I did it and I was like, okay, that was actually pretty good to have a purposeful pause in my day to stop and just move a pencil without any agenda. That felt, as, as somebody who doesn't get to sketch nearly as much as he would like to, um, it was, I found that to be very valuable. Um, however, if, we, if, if we're choosing a, a, a two minute practice for this next week, I would like to go, I was looking through the list of things that you were collecting in the Discord, and I was like, you know what, drawing, like a, doodling a D&D &D creature once a day for two minutes sounds actually pretty fun, and like, what can I do in two <laughs> minutes that would actually be, like, worth showing anybody? Um, that sounds, that sounds like a fun challenge to me. Oh, right. I love it. That sounds like an awesome next uh, two-minute practice. Um and no pressure. Uh, what are what are your reactions to this? Do we sound like we're we're onto something that that will lead somewhere to, toward benefit for us, or what do you think? Or is this yeah, just think, kind of a silly hobby? Well, I think being open to uh, to things coming of it is going to make it. But like, I think if you go if you go into it being like I'm going to make a thing for this, it's going to you know ruin what you're trying to do. But if you used to be like. I'm going to try a thing out. Let's see what happens. Maybe it'll, something, the whole idea of practicing is to lead up to something later. So let, let it happen. Um, like, you know, I, I've never done that. I've listened about the two minute challenges. I've never done one, but like I've done many, many, uh, thing, uh, like the, you know, like I talked on previous shows about me doing the 168 hour comic, which is a lot longer than two minutes. But like, that was, that, that was a thing that I set out to like, I'm just going to make a thing. I don't, I don't know if it's going to be good. I don't know if people are going to read it. Um, but then like uh, one of the characters I created in doing that is now the subject of a TV adaptation uh, in the works. So um, like you never know what's going to come of something. If you block off the possibility of it, you're, you know, that's just going to add 
the add back in the same stress that you're trying to get rid of. So just <laughs> do stuff and let it happen. One I would like to suggest you add that I like to do is um, within two minutes, find someone to say something nice to online or in real life. Uh, that's a good one. Find a piece of art to reply to find a, uh, you know, anything. That is, that is excellent. And that is a practice. That's a great one. That's a great one. I have to I have to admit, I've done more than one in a day before. <laughs> I might try to do a couple. It, uh, because two minutes is so affordable. That's the great thing is, uh, is, is it's, it's fun to do sometimes a couple of times because I, I know that it's so easy to waste two minutes that uh, <laughs> just to use it purposefully. It's, it's kind of easy. It would okay. be there, you know, uh, it would be also easy to go too far that direction, but, but just a little bit like uh, also pretty affordable. Question, question for both of you, starting with Ryan, do you have any advice on creating any kind of like informal rubric for how do you find something nice to say about somebody or their work? What are you, what do you look for as qualities that like, that's the signal that I need to boost on that person? <clears throat> um, I mean, I, I think that the the best thing is to just do it naturally, not seek out like, and it's like, I, I was just thinking about as you're talking, like that's, it'd be a hard one to, to do on your show because then like, if you say, if you go out and say nice things to people and they listen to your show and like, yeah, I did a challenge where I had to say nice things to people and they're like, Oh gee, thanks guys. But, <laughs> but, Darn it. but if you, uh, if you, if you, I just genuinely myself to this in, in, in a way, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, that, yeah. That, that'll go. That's great context. Yeah. But, it, but if you, if you just hmm. like, not like in this two minutes, I have to find something and like, I, what am I going to say? But just like be open to the possibility of like if I see something that affects me, I'll genuinely respond to it. Is you know, it's it's not the practice isn't in how do I say nice things. It's in like how do I when I when I feel the need to say something, I don't just keep scrolling, I say what I want to say. Because mm. we all see things we want to respond to and just do what you what you naturally think of doing, but like it feels a little weird. It's an attent it's it's being attentive to the moment thing rather than like planning time to do that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Got and it. I mean, if, if you do within two minutes, you can be like, let's scroll for two minutes and you know, you're going to see something you want to respond to. Um, mm -hmm. Someone's going to post some art that, that is great. You know, what I like about this is that, I mean, so there it's, it's almost like I get the urge to hit the like button easily within two minutes. And then I'll, sometimes I think where my brain goes though, is that, this is inspiring. I want to write an article about it. This I, I want to, and I think like, and I can't possibly reply to it unless I go do a pile of homework or unless mm -hmm. I dig deeper into the topic and I don't want to come off in, in half-hearted or half-informed or what have you. But there's probably a way to keep it at a genuine, um, um, attentive awareness and conversational type of reply as opposed to something that's, you know, some deep creative research thing or mm -hmm. you know science project yeah it doesn't, it doesn't need to, to like project the the difference between clicking the like button and saying i love that pose is just a huge huge difference like it you know it it it's someone speaking out about something someone did and it just it means so much to say even just i love that pose it's as simple as that or that hair looks great you know mm-hmm well, cool. That's awesome. So if you, uh, if you wanted to, you know, pick your own two minute practices, it's great to just, uh, you don't have to do the same one for seven days in a row, but one approach we, we think of is to uh, pick a practice, then uh, pick a way to time yourself. That's, that's going to work. Give it a try and decide if this is the one you're going to continue with and mm -hmm. then try to stick with it for a few days um, yep. before you pick another one to try. And then in, if you feel like it, Share your experience and results in the uh, Lean Into Art Discord in the, the Challenges Quest channel, and we'll be glad to talk about it with you. Ryan, thank you so much for doing this show with us and staying up late. Um, I, hope, uh, I hope anybody listening will check out the Band Book Club, which you can find on IndieBound.org. You can find it at RyanEstrada.com. Um, 
you're going you've been doing a tour for this right uh yeah well, i've been doing a digital tour where i'm trying to go to visit as many uh library because i live in south korea so we mm-hmm. did fly out for a couple of events but uh it's you know a little bit of a, of a trip to do a uh, physical tour so we're just we've been uh doing skype visits with libraries and podcasts and classrooms if anybody wants uh any teachers or librarians want to talk to uh me or hyunsuk um let me know and uh hopefully how Band can they Book reach Club out is, to you would that be uh, like a tweet or how, how um, can they reach well, out to you my email is ryan at ryanestrada.com or just go to ryanestrada.com there's a little button there or i'm at ryan Estrada on twitter anywhere you find me message me um i'm happy to to talk to anybody and uh band book club is available literally everywhere you can get books i i i tend to send people to indie bound just because uh i like indie bookstores and part of the book is about how indie bookstores helped the the uh revolution there it's also on all the giant evil conglomerates i just don't link to them as much because <laughs> they don't need my help <laughs> that's right <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I think we did a podcast. So thank you once again, Ryan. Uh, we record the show usually on Thursdays. Lately, it's had to be on Wednesdays because of my goofy schedule. Uh, we record around noon Eastern time. We stream it live on twitch.tv slash Alina Tuart and then collect it as a podcast at patreon.com slash Alina Tuart and Alina Um Until next time, I have been Jersey Drozd of Alina and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger, also of leanintoart.com. And I'm Rob Stenzinger, places like Instagram. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart. And you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.